three minutes, three minutes until we're gonna begin. So thank you everybody who's making their way in. Please make your way towards the front and center. This is gonna be a packed house. If everybody could grab a drink at the bar, head on in. We'll begin in just a couple minutes.
The bar is closed. We'll begin the program in less than a minute. Please find your way into your seats. We're going to begin in less than one minute. Ladies and gentlemen, fellows and fellows, to begin the program this evening, please welcome Aspen Institute trustee and president of the McNulty Foundation, Ann Welsh McNulty. Thank you, hello, and welcome to everyone. My name is Ann Welsh McNulty. And to me and my family, and to all of us at the McNulty Foundation, this is one of the most exciting days of the year. When we get to announce and present to you this year's McNulty Prize laureates. Five people, five very impressive people, who will challenge and inspire you. We are happy today to host a conversation between two of our favorite McNulty people, that is between Holara Atuno, who is one of our judges for the McNulty Prize jury, and Lana Abuhijle, who is one of our McNulty Prize winners. I want to give a special welcome to Sep Secretary Albright, to our uh, Institute trustees are here, to my friends, and of course, to all the fellows including some 14 laureates, McNulty Prize laureates, who are here with us this evening. As I was reflecting on the conference theme of borders, I wanted to share one important truth that is really the driving force behind our foundation. And that is that there is a razor-thin line between you and someone in much more difficult circumstances. Saying this is easy, but truly accepting it is hard. Because accepting it means you have to accept a long line of responsibilities that go with that. It forces us to admit that circumstances propel some of us forward while holding others back. For example, my husband John and I benefited greatly from starting our careers in finance at the same time as the start of the longest bull market in American history. Naturally, we thought we were brilliant, but it also enabled us to leave our jobs on Wall Street before age 50. Now, we worked hard, we were smart, but still, we recognized the role of circumstance and opportunity that allowed us to be more successful and reward it more than our parents and grandparents. Now, John, without, I'm sorry, John understood this better than anyone. John's father was born in Ireland, and at age 12, he became an orphan. So he needed to leave school to provide for his brothers and sisters. At age 18, he emigrated to the US to find work. And he held a succession of jobs, one of which as a baggage handler at the Philadelphia airport, until he finally started his own landscaping business. John's mother was a housekeeper, ironically, for a Wall Street partner. Now, John was the first of his family to have the chance to go to college. He transformed from the very, very shy boy that I met in high school 
to ultimately become himself a partner in a Wall Street firm. But he really always recognized that it was not just his hard work and success, but the opportunities he had had that made him achieve more than his parents. Now, opp opportunity and circumstance also played a big role in my story. My dad grew up with seven siblings in a small row house in North Philadelphia. After World War II broke out, and once he turned 18, he enlisted in the US Air Force. Now after the war, Congress passed the GI Bill. So if you could get into college, the government would pay. Though back then, of course, many colleges did not admit students of color. So the GI Bill mostly benefited white veterans. Still, for my dad, that was a life changer. Without the GI Bill, he would never have gone to college, would never have become an engineer. So those opportunities really propelled him forward. Now, on the other hand, circumstances arguably held my mother back. She didn't get to go to college. At that time, her parents sent her brothers to college, you know, but not the girls. And I have to tell you, at age 94, she is still mad about it. <laughs> so most of us have found ourselves in circumstances that have propelled us forward, and many of us have been held back in different ways, whether by bias or lack of access to education or resources or employment. So today, this inequity really is the major focus of our foundation. But in this, so the McNulty Prize to us is a call to action. But we recognize that in this room, the McNulty Prize is really a celebration of all of you who have answered the call. You have shown the conviction to listen to others. You have shown the confidence to speak out for others. And you have shown the moral courage to work and strive for a more just world. Now today you will hear from two very well-loved members of our community. Our moderator, Lena, comes to us from the West Bank. She is a model of generosity, brilliance, warmth, and effectiveness, not to mention the glamour. She has spent her life and career working to build a better future for her people. We had the incredible opportunity to visit Lana earlier this year in Ramallah. And I must encourage you, anyone who has the chance, to go there to see the reality in the West Bank. The young people, the young Palestinians of her youth local council are really some of the most inspiring people you will ever meet. Now, Lana has been in the, was in the first class of Melly Fellows. I know we have a lot of Melly Fellows here today. She is an accomplished development expert of over 32 years. At Global Communities, she is the country director for the West Bank and Gaza. Further, she is the first woman to serve on the board of the Palestine Investment Fund, and she is also a board member of the Bank of Palestine. So Lena will be interviewing Olara Otuno, who has been fighting for people's basic right to for self-determination for decades. Olara was a young student activist and leader during the Idi Amin regime in Uganda. He became a powerful voice against this genocidal dictator until his life was threatened and he was forced to flee. Now many of us may think we have were tough activists in college, but most of us did not have to flee the country afterwards. Olara went on to lead the resistance from afar and ultimately ended up at the UN, where he held a succession of very significant roles, including Under Secretary General of the UN, 
and also Special Commissioner for Children and Armed Conflict. In 2011, Alara elected to return home and to lead the opposition party and to run for president. Alara has been a trustee of the Aston Institute since 1992 and has served on our McNulty Prize jury since the inception. His wisdom and kindness have steered us true. I know we're all eager to hear what these two champions of peace and opportunity have to share with us tonight. So let me welcome up to the stage Lana and Alara. Good evening, everybody. What an honor. Never thought six years ago that I will be having this conversation with you. Olara, as a Palestinian, Arab woman, I live with so many invisible and visible borders. But when I first met you, you came up to me and you said, Lana, I know who you are, where you come from, have the conviction justice will prevail. Don't let any borders stop you. And here we are, six years after, having this conversation. <laughs> so I, what I want to hear from you, what actually made this, Olara? What influenced you? What formed the foundation of who you are now? Someone who doesn't see invisible and visible borders, who fights for justice everywhere. Thank you, Lana. Thank you, Anne, and the incredible McNulty team. Um, what has made me, what has formed my set of values, my outlook, has come from several sources. I think the most important single source, if I had to zero in on one, would be a group of people most of you will never have heard of. <laughs> it's called the East African Revival. Now, this is a group of Christian evangelical movement founded in Africa, mainly based in Africa with a very African idiom of Christianity. A group of people who decided to take very seriously the teachings of Jesus and to shape their life, their outlook, the way they related to society and to people. My father happened to be one of the key leaders in that movement. And our home was the meeting place, the training ground. Our family was really this new tribe, this new family, this new group of people who had no blood relations with us. I benefited enormously from their incredible love, their courage, their simple but earth-shaking faith that's the milieu in which I grew up, me and all my uh, siblings. So. And uh, so not only from my parents, but also from them. And that really had a deep impact on me to this day. So that's the I, foundation you took with uh, you in order to? In, in terms of my values, in terms of who I am, I was also very fortunate growing up to have had extraordinary teachers. Mm. I still think I probably had the best teachers in the whole wide world. <laughs> they were regular, ordinary teachers in the villages, but so dedicated to the vocation of bringing up young people, inculcated in us the thirst for knowledge, exploring, and reaching out. 
And then in terms of you know, uh, the world and international affairs and what goes on around us, first, this community, the East African Revival, were people who came from all countries in the entire neighborhood. They were not from my community. They spoke different languages, but they were our family. But my father, in our house, we had one very valuable item with a little transistor radio. He would listen religiously to news broadcasts, bulletins from Deutsche Welle, Voice of America, BBC, in Swahili. And at the end of the evening, before we went to bed, we'd all assemble for the evening prayer. So he would brief us on what was going on around the world. This is happening in Congo, Nigeria. I even vaguely remember Vietnam and, and Middle East and so on. And then he would ask us to pray for the communities in distress, to pray for those situations. That was my introduction to international affairs and the world outside, in addition to this extraordinary community of people of simple faith, but just extraordinary spirit, love, generosity, and courage. And this is what you carried with you to university, and you couldn't? accept the injustice in your country, the Idi Amin era, the terror? I, I can't say that I carried all that with me. I hope <laughs> that some of it remain with me. <laughs> <laughs> some of it remain with me. Definitely. At university, Stay still now. Ma now Makerere University was a great center of excellence. A lot of political influence shaped a lot of the politics and leadership of Eastern, Central, Southern Africa mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah. And it was a big deal to be the president of the Student Guild and to lead that campus. Now, when I was elected president of the Student Guild, Idi Amin was in power. <laughs> so everything had changed. Political activities and political parties were banned. Uh, but the student guild and the student activities remained intact. So the hopes of the country now focused on the student body being the voice for the people, speaking up about the atrocities, about the disappearances, about the horrible things which were going on in the country. This role was thrust upon us. We didn't choose it. In the event, we had to decide whether to be co-opted. Amin had great charm offensives. He would be mm. very charming. Only when the charm didn't work, he would then pounce. So he did try to co-opt us. And in the, in the end, when we would not be co-opted, he then chose to pounce. Uh, so I had made a statement. We had made many statements, but this particular one. And then he decided this was enough. And he was going to move. So he dissolved the student body, dismissed me as student president had the troops around the campus. And a very sympathetic person high up in government sent a message to me saying, look, I can't do much to help you. Get but out. But they're coming for you. So do what you can. With the help of students and various sympathizers, we're able to organize uh, after several days of trying for me to get out into Nairobi, then Tanzania, then eventually further afield. I'm lucky to be alive, to have escaped from that uh, period. I would then be very much involved subsequently in the resistance against Idi Amin. And when Amin was removed from power many years later, yes. I was part of a small group that was the administration in charge of the country in the interim period, 30 of us who were in charge of the country. So at that time, you had a lot of hope for the country. And you left again to represent your own country at the UN? Well, the, the new Uganda wanted a new voice at the UN. Exactly. They wanted somebody to introduce the new post Idi Amin Uganda to the world. Mm -hmm. And it fell to my lot to be asked to do that. So I was sent to the UN initially for a temporary assignment in the hope that just for the interim period. Then I was asked to continue. And one thing led to another and ended up spending many years at the United Nations. My first stint at the UN was as the leader of the delegation of Uganda, Uganda's ambassador, 
So I was very active in the General Assembly, in the Security Council, the Commission on Human Rights, played various roles at a time when there was tremendous East-West conflict. You had uh, the East led by Russia, you had Amer the West led by America, then sometimes developing countries with China or without China. You were the commissioner for protection of children in armed conflict and women. And you brought that subject to the UN. That, that, that was my second stint at the UN. Right. The, the, the first time Tell us about that. I was representing Uganda. And that's another story for another day. But the second time, <laughs> uh, I, I was under Secretary General. And my brief was developing a regime for the protection of children and women in situations of conflict and their rehabilitation and uh, uh, development after conflict. So part of my immediate task was how to inscribe this issue on the agenda of the Security Council. Up until then, it was not in invasion of countries, high politics was all part of the agenda of the Security Council. That's right. But not the fate of those who are the worst affected when peace is broken and when conflict sinks in. So in the end, we were successful in doing that. And now the issue of the situation of women, children, ordinary people who are affected by conflict is an integral part of the Security Council agenda. But what I really want to share with you, perhaps, is not so much what the UN or even my little role did, but what I witnessed on the ground. Yes. You know what I witnessed. Generally, we see and we think of the ugliness, the evil in conflict situation, the bloodshed. That, that is what uh, immediately hits us. We forget the human stories. But what we don't always notice, which I was very struck by, was just how much goodness, how much generosity, how much incredible sacrifice mm. is done by regular, ordinary people in the same theater, in the same place where there's this ugliness and hatred and bloodshed. It's as if evil and good were competing for supremacy in this one theater. Yes. Over and over again, I saw this. I, I couldn't give you all the examples. Um, and now, since we're talking about borders, I, I must share this with you. I went to Sudan, and I went to a camp where there were uh, refugees from Eritrea. So when we finished talking, I asked them, is there anything that is particularly important for you that you want the UN to do for you? So the elderly gentleman stands up, he's a Muslim, and he says, yes, uh, we of the Muslim community have a place of worship right there. But our brethren and sisters of the Christian community don't have a place to worship. This is a serious problem. Could you do something about this? No borders. I, I was stunned. You know, especially I was coming from New York where we were busy debating. Some of you will recall the big debate going on about the clash of civilizations, mm. part of which was to do with the clash between Christians and Muslims. Never mind that I had to give the disappointing news that the UN was actually not in the business of building a, a church or a mosque. But that's what they wanted for the Christian brethren. <laughs> then about the same time, I go to Sierra Leone, deep in a village. And their practice in Sierra Leone, when you come together, you begin by prayer. So before we started, they began to recite the first verses of the Quran. I assume, therefore, that this was a predominantly Muslim community. I was about to stand up to begin speaking <laughs> when they proceeded to recite the Lord's Prayer. But it was the same lips that recited both the Hadith and, and the, the Lord's Prayer. Now, I was confused. So when I asked them later, what, what is going on? They laughed at me. They said, but, but when it is the big feast for the Christian, we all go to the church. 
where it is a big feast for the Muslims, they go to the mosque. And we have so many, they call them Christmas families. Now, Christmas means Chris, then M-U-S, meaning Christian Muslim families. <laughs> now, these are families, I, I, never, I never heard this uh, term before. These are families, the father is a Muslim, the mother is a Christian, two girls are Christians, three boys are Muslims, <laughs> and it's no big deal for them. Now, this was completely revolutionary. For You're me. describing my story. That, that they were, Muslim they, and a Christian I mean, they, family. <laughs> Well, there you are. So they were not just accepting each other's different uh, faiths, but they were celebrating them. Of course. You know? But what, what that in part underscores really that in many situations of conflict that take on identity issues, whether of religion, ethnicity, it doesn't happen naturally. It doesn't happen by itself. I think most communities left to themselves can live together they know how to support each other. Uh, a group, a leader, orchestrates, manipulates, develops a narrative, usually a false narrative, to mobilize around this issue and have us and them. That's right. That is really what I saw over and over again. From and that international course, scene, Olara, working for the cause of peace around the world, Uganda called on you and you decided to go home, but which is not an easy decision. Well. But you needed to go home. Well, you know, even one other thing, then I'll, I'll make a comment about going back to Uganda. The issue of reconciliation and healing in the situations in which I worked, you see, you cannot leapfrog your way from a situation of denial to reconciliation. When there's been some very grievous wrong, some terrible situation of suffering, <laughs> there has to be recognition, acknowledgement of what has happened. Now we talk of truth telling. That these are the facts, because a lot of that is surrounded in false narratives, propaganda, exaggeration. These are the facts. This happened to so and so by so and so. Yeah. Not for the purpose of having revenge or retribution, no. But when you have the facts and acknowledgement of what happened, it releases. We talked so much about it that. It makes before. it then possible to so begin talking about accountability for, for the key people, not everybody, but for the key people, and embracing each other again and reconciling and healing. We've got to go through this valley of reckoning, of acknowledgement, of saying, yes, this happened, and so and so did it, but now let's reconcile. So close. To very important. Very whether, whether in the context of Uganda, where, where it is very much applicable, or elsewhere. I decided some years ago, having spent most of my professional life abroad, most of my work was done outside Uganda, but realized that even though I made some modest contribution in the UN, different countries in conflict, post-conflict, peace and so on, there was this one little place, this godforsaken banana republic called Uganda. <laughs> you know, which I happened to be born there, I grew up there, which wasn't really part of this, you know, where the condition of our people was abominable. And I decided I, I could no longer accept this from outside. I had to go back, be involved, bear testimony, be part of the struggle, try to make change. Did you have any nostalgia about that place you called home? Um, did you yes, feel? Yes, I suppose, I, suppose you I, would just I, 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 I did. But of course, once there, I had also had huge continuing cultural shock because I found in the meantime there had been a radical transformation, in my view, much for the worse. Right and that the things which were there, which shaped me and so many people had broken and gone. 
A lot of this didn't happen by itself. It wasn't sort of gradual retrogression, no. It was manipulated, engineered, created at the political social level to make the country safe for a certain kind of rule. And worse, the people had been so brainwashed and uh, beaten over the decades that they had now come to accept as normal this radically abnormal situation. Mm. So they would say to me, but this is how it is. But this is how it is in Uganda. But you've been away for so long. You know? So part of the struggle really is letting the people realize that they deserve so, so much better. That from their own soil there was a better heritage. And that they can look forward to a better one. So you spoke if, up. Well, you spoke up. <laughs> and you paid the price. Tell us about the last nine years. Well, what happened to it's, you? It's, it's been a lot of struggles at various levels. I won't go into it. Our, our time is up. But just more recently, you were mentioning me earlier, I had uh, two court cases. One was I was accused of committing treason and sedition against the country's leader, the president. I didn't deny what I was being alleged to have said. I said everything that they said I said. And I <laughs> said, in court, I will explain myself and, and show why what I said was well-founded. In the event, for eight years, I was told, come back next month. The judge is on leave. Come back next month. The file isn't available. Come back next month. So I never actually had my real day in court, although I was a prisoner going in and out of the court for eight years. And then in the end, the judge tells me, well, the state has lost interest in the case. The case is therefore dropped. <laughs> All right, so off went the treason and the sedition after eight years. But the same remarks had also given rise to another case, which was the police summoning me to turn up at the intelligence headquarters to be interrogated. And this could be days, you'd be locked up. It's... And I said, yes, I've received the summons. No, I won't go to the intelligence headquarters. So four times they served me, and four times I said yes, but didn't go. <laughs> and then they said, in that case, we'll prosecute you. I said, fine, I'll go to court, and I'll explain myself in court. So they took me to court, and I then promptly took the matter to the Constitutional Court, saying the law under which I was mm -hmm. being forced to go to interrogation center was actually against the letter and spirit of the Constitution. Now, that remained in the Constitutional Court for nine years. Again, come back next month, come back next month, but finally in May, the Constitutional Court unanimously decided that yes, it was indeed unconstitutional, struck off the law. That's a win. Uh, now, That's a win, Nola. What is significant about this is probably not the win. It's a, it's a small win. In the context of Uganda, probably earth-shaking. Exactly. But it is, it is and, and, it, and it will not change things tomorrow in Uganda. But what is significant is whether at the Ugandan level, at the international level, or in any other country, that when there are important ideas, whether the rule of law or justice or reconciliation or fighting against impunity or corruption, it's worth keeping those ideas alive. Yes. It's, it's worth, <laughs> you, yes. even, if, even if it may not be today or tomorrow, it that, will happen. Uh, the fruit will show, but worth keeping that alive and letting people know it's worth fighting for that better day and for that better time. We continue to fight and justice will prevail. Ladies and gentlemen, Olara Akuna. We are all faced with a choice. Will we stay in our worlds, perfectly content to look out from behind our fences? Or will we show a conviction to act? 
We couldn't wait. We had to start something. These are people that are living their daily life and they think, I need to figure out how to turn what I'm doing into something that will help others. For me, leadership is about taking people to a better place that they wouldn't have gone to on their own. If we don't do this, we're not sure anyone else will. We lift the trajectory of people's lives and point them towards what they were meant to do on this planet. I can't imagine a higher calling. Societies are better if we are enlarging our own views and seeing what we can do to help others. The most important thing is that we don't give up. We all have a duty to make this world a better one. We are all bound to each other. We are a part of a common humanity. So those wonderful videos, of course, are because April Aj and Nina Sani and Johnny all work on them with our filmmakers A and B. So. It's always fun to watch them. So I'm very excited to begin the next part of our program, which is honoring this year's McNulty Prize laureates. Presenting their awards will be the chairman of our jury, professor, author, and former Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright. <laughs> Secretary Albright works around the world advancing democracy and opportunity through the National Democratic Institute and protecting democracy with her latest book, Fascism, A Warning. So please welcome Secretary Madeleine Albright to join us on the stage. And now it's my honor to introduce this year's laureates. For creating an inclusive tech entrepreneurship ecosystem in Cape Town, South Africa, and securing a place for thousands of young people to participate in its growth, Joshin Ragabar for City. So 20 years ago, I was starting out in my career trying to build a future for myself. This was at the same time that South Africa was still transitioning out of the isolation of its apartheid years, where it was isolated politically, culturally, and economically. And as we looked to the world, the rest of the world, we could see that the internet and technology was changing everything. And the world was racing headfirst into a knowledge economy. But back home in South Africa, it felt like we were being left behind, and our future was very constrained. So as a young person, I had two choices, like we all do. I could either leave or stay and try to change the environment that I lived in. So a group of us got together and formed the Cape Innovation and Technology Initiative, CITI, to develop a technology and entrepreneurial ecosystem that could give us the inclusive growth and make us a vibrant global technology economy. So over the years, our incubation programs and our acceleration programs have supported thousands of entrepreneurs and technology companies. Our skills programs work with young people who are unemployed, give them the technical and digital training they need, and place them into fast track technology careers. We have targeted clustering initiatives where we try to pick what we think are going to be the industries of the future and try to stimulate them. Most recently, last month, we launched the first biotech incubator in Africa as one such initiative. So over the 20 years, this work has seen us generate over 4,000 technology companies in the city, 
generating over 40,000 homegrown technology jobs, moving us from pretty much nowhere 20 years ago to being the number one tech city in Africa and one of the leading tech cities in the world. But technology continues to accelerate and the disruption continues to grow. And looking ahead, we know that by 2035, there will, will be more young Africans pouring into adulthood, ready to enter the workplace than the rest of the world combined. And if African cities do not actively design and develop their economies to include these young people, it's going to be a disaster. So at City, we've set ourselves an ambitious goal. We call it City 20 by 20, which is to work to expand our model, which has been successful in one city, to include 20 African cities within the next 20 years so that we can transform these African economies so that these digital economies leave no one behind. So I'm going to reach out to all of you, and particularly my African fellows, to join us in this journey as we try to get to 20 by 20. Thank you very much. For mobilizing the mothers of today to safeguard the lives of every generation that will inherit our earth, in the United States, Kelsey Worth for Mothers Out Front. When my daughter Sophie was four years old, I was reading a book to her one night about coral reefs, when I suddenly realized that all the world's coral reefs are predicted to die during her lifetime because of climate change. It was the first time I saw the climate crisis through the eyes of a mother whose number one priority is to protect my children. I felt grief, despair, and anger. How is it that we've made so little progress in addressing the climate crisis, given years of scientific evidence, years of mobilizing and lobbying by the environmental community? and the unfolding realities that we see all around us. The problem is a political one. What we've been most missing is a well-organized, broad-based constituency pushing our leaders to act. I founded Mothers Out Front to harness the fierce determination and passion of mothers to protect their children and to build a grassroots movement of women from all backgrounds to compel decision makers to take bold action. In an era of online petitions and digital connection, we bring mothers together face to face and build human relationships and community which sustains our work. We develop mothers' leadership through coaching and training, and we provide a structure of teams at the local, state, and national levels for them to work in. Very importantly, we center equity and justice in all that we do. Our mothers make things happen because we don't take no for an answer. We meet with elected officials and business leaders. We testify at hearings. We write op-eds. We rally, we tweet, and we win. And when we feel tired and we want to quit, we look at our children and feel ever greater resolve. Our mothers in Massachusetts read about gas leaks in the newspaper, went out and met with elected officials, physically tagged gas leaks in cities and towns across the state, and then sat down with utility executives to develop a plan for fixing the largest leaks in two years. Our mothers in San Jose, California, convinced city, their city council to pass the nation's largest community clean energy program. And over 100 of our members from indigenous and Latinx communities rallied outside the climate summit last September to demand that their governor and other leaders stop supporting oil and gas that is especially harmful to frontline communities of color. In six years, Mothers Out Front has become a national movement with 43 teams across seven states. Our goal is to double in size in the next two years and soon after that be in all 50 states. The science tells us 
We have 11 years to transform our energy economy and move away from fossil fuels in order to avoid the most devastating impacts of climate change. What could be possibly more important than to act now for the sake of our children? Thank you. For building up women across Central America, from villages to the highest ranks of government and business, along with a coalition of more than 100 Cali Fellows, Maria Pacheco and Alexander Kissling for Vital Voices Central America. Why would a woman pack a few belongings in her backpack, hold one child against her chest, grab the other one, and start walking a thousand miles into uncertainty? She would do it because she knows if not, she will die, and her children will die. And the one thing she can do is walk. And that's why we're seeing the caravans that we're seeing them. And we're seeing them in a very polarized world one that it's very hard to watch. But one of the things that keeps us hopeful in Central America is what we've learned as Aspen Fellows and as part of Vital Voices. We have learned that it's by building bridges how you transform realities. And we have learned that it's by empowering women how you create sustainable change. And the change we're dreaming of, it's that it's products and services that cross those borders but it's our families that stay together <laughs> in our homes. Um, the reality, though, is very hard. We still, we're a very machista region where a lot of girls are taken out of school by the time they're 12, and where many women, even though they might have an education, there are spaces that are not open for them. But we know, we know that together we can transform this reality. And we know that it's key that women have a seat at the table. And that's why the work that Vital Voices does is so important. We have harnessed the power of 118 Cali Fellows that are tackling gender inequality as a regional issue because our economies are interdependent and we need more women in order to grow. We help them to achieve economic empowerment through mentoring and business development. At the base of a pyramid, we help them to start their small businesses, food services, crafts. At the middle level, we help them to grow their established businesses. At the upper level, we help them to get into leadership positions, boards, to truly have a voice to make an effective change. We have reached more than 100,000 women and their families. It's known. It's known that women invest 90% of their income in their families' health care, education, and nutrition. Thus, mortality, pregnancies, and violence are reduced. This is all about not just human rights, but a huge economic impact for our region. That is why when we, we invest, invest in, in women, women, we transform the world. <laughs> for creating a sustainable, socially conscious business that offers consumers ethically sourced milk products and dairy farmers better training and incomes in India, Sri Kumar Mishra for Milk Mantra.
Growing up as a little child, I would often visit my grandparents' farm and play with uh, several children there, children of the farmhands who used to work there. But in a few years, uh, I noticed that several of the older children would stop playing and be themselves working in the farms. Soon I would realize that these children never got the chance in their lives to make that change, to come out of that endless loop of poverty. Many years later, I would quit my job in London and return back to India, to my home state, Odisha, to set up Milk Mantra, a new age dairy food startup, to solve the large problem of trust deficit between consumers and food. A trust deficit arising out of uh, opaque supply chains and adulterated food. But I wanted to solve this problem, not just by building an innovative premium brand and a scalable business, but by also creating an ethical sourcing network that would impact the lives of poor farmers as we grew. Imagine these are very poor farmers who might have, at best, have a cow or two, maybe a small parcel of land to till. Imagine a farmer with just a few dollars of daily income for his entire household. That's the kind of farmer I'm talking about. When we started eight years back, we had seven farmers show up on day one. And today, our ethical milk sourcing program has 60,000 farmers impacting a third of a million rural lives. <laughs> lives that have been impacted because these poor farmers have access to a reliable and regular income stream now, which has supplemented their income levels substantially to the extent of 70%. And beyond that, it also has empowered the women folk in the villages because generally it's the women who look after the cows and they have the access to this income. They have a new voice in the family now. They have dignity in the village and are able to afford a better health care and education for their children. There are 75 million such rural women farmers, dairy farmers, just in India. We are well on our way to impacting a million rural lives in the next few years, and I think we're just getting started. I believe that Milk Mantra somewhere is providing that opportunity to those children that I saw in my grandparents' farms who, who didn't have the means to get out of that endless cycle. They have the opportunity now to make a generational change out of poverty. Thank you. We are thrilled to honor the work of these laureates, and doubly so to do so here in a room full of their peers. You all understand better than anyone that this work is hard, that the road to success is littered with obstacles and setbacks. Earlier today, Dan Porterfield played a clip from John F. Kennedy's 1962 speech. It's known as the We Choose to Go to the Moon speech, and that's the most famous line. But the most important part of the speech is what comes after. Not because it is easy, but because it is hard. The moon could have been anything, but choosing it focused the energies, as JFK put it, of our very best. And as good as those very best minds were, there were terrible setbacks. The first test of the Apollo spacecraft was a national tragedy, killing three astronauts whom the public knew well. They learned and they continued. Now, this is a weird room because it's full of the people who are actually doing the hard thing. You know these lessons. We also know even this large gathering of committed people is not enough to make it to that next moon. We need to grow the number of people 
answering that call. So I'm calling on you to call on others to do the hard thing, to recruit those who could be doing but aren't. Be annoying. <laughs> be rude. Make people uncomfortable. Because we need to ask, we, <clears throat> because we need everyone to ask themselves what they can do for humanity. Not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Thank you very much, and I urge you all to continue the wonderful work you do. Have a nice night. That concludes this evening's program. There's going to be dinner in the hub tonight and drinks served outside. But if all the former McNulty laureates could please come to the front of the stage for some photo ops, that'd be wonderful. Have a great evening. <laughs>